This video will be divided into four parts, the first being making a PMMA solution, next up cutting and cleaning silicon wafers, then spin casting, and finally annealing. But first let's talk about personal protective equipment. For lab safety, you will need the following personal protective equipment. First, if you have long hair, you should tie it back with a hair tie because you don't want to get into what you're working with. Of course, you'll need gloves. And lastly, a lab coat. Making sure, of course, that you are wearing long pants and closed shoes. Let's get started with the first part, making a PMMA solution. We're going to need to weigh out small amounts of PMMA and dissolve it so that it becomes a solution. But since our stock often becomes one large piece, we'll need to break it up somehow. Here, I use a mortar and pestle. Be patient when breaking apart your PMMA, because if you aren't and you hit it at the wrong angle and with too much force, it may slide out of the mortar. When you've broken off enough pieces of PMMA to fill about a fifth the volume of a scintillation vial, you can take the rest of the big piece and put it back into its stock container. Then carefully transfer the pieces from the mortar to your scintillation vial. Close the vial and label it. It's always important to label any sample that you create. Here, I'm only identifying the contents of the vial, but you'll see in other samples that I create in this video that I also write my name and the date. This is important for you and others to identify your samples and their contents. Let's weigh an appropriate amount of PMMA for our solution. You'll need some weighing paper. I like to fold it along its diagonals to make it shaped sort of like a boat. This way, when you're moving the paper around, the PMMA won't slide off really easily. Now place your weighing paper on your scale, close the door, and zero the scale. It should look like this. You're going to be weighing out 300 milligrams of PMMA. Make sure to close the doors of the scales for more precise measurements. The reason we're doing this is because 20 milliliters of volume fits comfortably in a scintillation vial, and we're looking for a 15 milligram per milliliter solution of PMMA in toluene. 300 milligrams is the appropriate weight for this. With a glass pipette, a glass beaker, and a pipette bulb, we can measure out our 20 milliliters of toluene. You can find the stock toluene bottle inside the safety cabinet. When taking out bottles from safety cabinets and putting them back in, you should always close the doors in between those steps. This way, if a fire occurs outside of the cabinet, then the hazardous chemicals inside of the cabinet will be protected from that fire and not make it worse. With all the necessary materials for making a PMMA solution under the fume hood, we can begin by pouring our weighed out PMMA into a new scintillation vial. It's important to work under the hood with toluene because it is a toxic chemical with a high vapor pressure. Now we can pour our toluene into our glass beaker. This has to be made out of glass because toluene dissolves plastic. Don't pour too far over the 20 milliliter marking of the beaker because we don't want to waste too much toluene. Take note that I'm pouring the toluene into a beaker because under no circumstances should anyone be putting pipettes into the stock solution. This would be bad because contaminating the stock could ruin experiments for many people. To pipette our toluene into our scintillation vial, we're going to need to know how to use this bulb. You need to create negative pressure so that you can have suction. You can press down on the bulb while squeezing the A for this. Then you can draw up liquid by squeezing on the S and you can evacuate the liquid by squeezing on the E. And that's pretty much it. Now you can use your glass pipette to transfer 20 milliliters of toluene from your beaker to your scintillation vial. Make sure to take note of the markings on the pipette so that you can measure an appropriate amount of toluene. To get rid of excess toluene from your beaker, you can go to the left safety cabinet which contains the waste bottles. Never pour anything back into the stock bottle as this would contaminate it. Also, always be careful and read the labels of the waste solutions so that you do not mix any wastes that oughtn't to be mixed. After emptying a chemical from a container into a waste bottle, the container needs to be cleaned by rinsing it with DI water three times. Typically, the first rinse goes into the waste bottle and the second and third can go down the drain. In the case of toluene, however, water should not go into its waste bottle. So in this case, let the beaker sit in the hood for a good 15 minutes so that the last drops of toluene that didn't get into the bottle evaporate. Once it's dry, triple rinse it and return it to the drying rack. Before the glass pipette can go to glass waste, it also needs to be completely dry. So place your used pipette in the drying rack in the back of the hood. Don't worry about emptying the drying rack, a designated person will do that. 
Now we can label our PMMA solution. I've put my name, the date, and the concentration of the solution, including the identities of the solute and the solvent, in this case, PMMA and toluene. There's one last thing to do with the solution under the hood before we let it dissolve overnight. Take the cap off the vial and put in a magnetic stir bar. And before putting the cap back onto the vial, place a piece of tin foil in between. This way, if the vial gets knocked over, the toluene will not dissolve the cap, which is made out of plastic. Now we can place our newly made PMMA solution onto our magnetic stir. Turn it on so that the stir bar starts to spin. This facilitates the dissolution of the PMMA into the toluene. And now, leave it overnight. The next day, we can return to the hood with our fully dissolved PMMA solution, a new scintillation vial, a syringe, and a filter attachment for the syringe. After attaching the filter, we can pour our solution into the syringe and push the solution through the filter with the syringe's plunger. This is done to filter any foreign particles that may have gotten into the vial out of the solution so that we can minimize imperfections or irregularities in the thin film we will eventually make from this solution. Place a piece of tin foil between your filtered solutions cap and vial and don't forget to label your sample. Apart from my name, the date, the concentration, and the solute and solvent identities, I've also included that this solution is filtered so that I can keep track of my samples. Now that we've completed making our polymethyl methacrylate solution, we can begin cutting and cleaning our silicon wafers. It's important to note when working with silicon that the dull side is the part where we can score and cut on, and the shiny side is the part where the thin film is going to go. So it's always important to protect the shiny side of the silicon wafer. Since we've already used part of this wafer, we can cut today's samples from this piece of silicon. Silicon shards can be very painful if they get in your eyes, so you should use goggles for this part. The samples we're aiming for are about 1 to 1.5 centimeters squared squares. We use this scribing setup to make cutting the large pieces evenly a bit easier. Secure the wafer, shiny side down, on a piece of clean room wipe onto the stage by placing its top and left edges partially under the Teflon pieces that are screwed to the platform, and fasten the Teflon down by tightening the screws by hand. They don't have to be terribly tight, just tight enough so that the piece doesn't move around so easily. You can precisely measure the width of the strip you're about to make by scribing the silicon if you use a pin just above frame that has millimeter markings on it, which allow you to track the distance you've moved the diamond cutter attachment to the left or to the right. But here, I've eyeballed the width and moved the diamond cutter along a different track and flipped a lever to keep it in place once I was satisfied with its position. Then I gently placed the diamond cutter tip down onto the dull side of the silicon and slightly applied pressure as I moved the stage back and forth a few times to score a straight line. Wipe off extra silicon dust with a clean room wipe as the dust can attach to the shiny surface and produce thin film irregularities later on. We can apply even pressure to the line we just scribed and ensure that we cut the wafer along that line by using another little setup. First, place the wafer shiny side down onto a clean room wipe on the left platform and align the scribed line with the gap in the movable attachment. Make sure that the line is parallel with the outer wall of the movable attachment and not at an angle with it. Then bring down the attachment to apply pressure and the wafer should snap along the line. These setups aren't totally necessary, but they make being precise a bit easier. Finally, you can lift the attachment and take your newly cut silicon strip off of the setup. And now for cutting the squares from the strip. Of course, we start shiny side down on a clean room wipe. There are two ways to make the small cuts that I show you here. You can scribe where you want to cut and place pressure on the edges with your diamond cutter and the back of your tweezer. The pressure you apply with the diamond cutter though is more like a scraping from the edge of the surface of the silicon off the side and onto the wipe. Or you can place a little pressure on the center of an invisible line where you want to cut your wafer with the tips of your tweezer and scrape the edge like before with your diamond cutter. With your wafer cut, we can move on to cleaning the pieces. Before starting with any solutions, preheat a hot plate in the hood by setting it to 125 degrees Celsius. Using the left wafer dispenser at the sink, the one labeled Q-Pod, rinse your wafers with DI water a good three to five times to get rid of any particles from the beaker or excess silicon dust. There are two ways that you can work the dispenser. You can click to start dispensing the water and click to stop or you can click and hold to dispense the water and let go to stop. When you finish rinsing, measure out 30 milliliters of DI water. 
For this step in the cleaning, apart from the water, you're going to need ammonium hydroxide from the corrosive cabinet underneath the fume hood. And you'll need hydrogen peroxide from the refrigerator in room 313. You'll be mixing 10 milliliters of ammonium hydroxide, a strong base, into the beaker that holds your silicon wafers in 30 milliliters of water. And you'll be mixing 10 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide into the same beaker. This makes a 3 to 1 to 1 ratio by volume of water to ammonium hydroxide to hydrogen peroxide. Cover up your beaker with a piece of foil and poke some holes into it to allow gas to escape. Then, place your covered beaker onto the preheated hot plate at 125 degrees Celsius. Wait 3 to 5 minutes for the solution to boil and then let the solution sit on the hot plate for 15 minutes while boiling. If it doesn't start to bubble after those first 3 to 5 minutes, start the timer anyway. This sometimes happens. After 15 minutes have passed, remove the beaker from the hot plate and set it to cool. The solution cannot be poured into its appropriate waste bottle while it is still so hot because this may cause a reaction. If you don't want to wait until the solution cools to start the next cleaning step, however, you can pour the solution into a separate beaker and let that cool while you move on with the beaker that contains the wafers you're cleaning. Remember when triple rinsing the wafers that the first rinse goes into the bottle, so pour that first rinse into the cooling beaker and the second and third can go down the drain. Because the next cleaning step involves a strong acid, take extra precaution while rinsing by rinsing more than just three times, maybe five or six times. This will make sure that there's no leftover base in the beaker to strongly react with the acid you're about to add to that beaker. When done rinsing, add 30 milliliters of DI water to the beaker again for the next step. For the next step, you're going to need sulfuric acid from the acid cabinet underneath the hood. And you'll need your hydrogen peroxide from the refrigerator again. This solution will also contain a 3 to 1 to 1 ratio by volume, but this time 3 parts DI water to 1 part sulfuric acid to 1 part hydrogen peroxide. Because we've poured 30 milliliters of DI water to the beaker, we will now pour 10 milliliters of sulfuric acid to the beaker and 10 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide to the beaker. Just like before, place a piece of tin foil, but not the same piece of foil, on top of the beaker, poke holes in it, and place it on the 125 degree hot plate. Wait 3-5 to five minutes for the solution to boil, and then leave it on the hot plate for 15 minutes. While you are waiting for those 15 minutes to pass, and your ammonium hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and water solution has sufficiently cooled down, you can dispose of that solution in its appropriate waste container. Remember to double check the label of the waste container you're using to be sure that you're using the right one. Pour the solution into the container, pour the first rinse into the container, and put the waste container back into the cabinet. Then, you can do the second and third rinses, and perhaps a couple extra, pouring them down the drain, and return the beaker to the hood for use as a cool-down beaker again with the sulfuric acid, hydrogen peroxide, and water solution once its 15 minutes on the hot plate have passed. And by now, the steps after the 15 minutes have passed should look familiar. Remove the beaker from the hot plate, pour the solution into the cool-down beaker, pour the first rinse into the beaker, and rinse twice more. When the beaker solution has cooled down, get the sulfuric acid, hydrogen peroxide, and water waste bottle and pour the solution and the first rinse of the cool down beaker into the waste container. Now, we can prepare for the next wafer cleaning step, which requires some extra personal protective equipment. Namely, an apron and some heavy duty rubber gloves. This step will involve hydrofluoric acid. While it is a weak acid in chemistry, it can still produce very severe burns and injuries if you come in direct contact with it. Therefore, when using HF, you should always know where the calganate, an antidote for HF burns, is. In room 313, it is located near the eyewash station and the door. For this step, fill the bottom of a plastic petri dish with DI water. It is important that it be made of plastic because HF dissolves glass. The HF is in the acid cabinet under the hood. But before we start the last cleaning step, let's set up a few things since we'll be spin casting immediately after this step. The spin caster controller allows you to program the speed and duration of a spin, so let's go over how to program the settings that we need. First, press step and 1, then speed ramp and plug in the speed, which is 2500 RPM, and press enter. Then, press step terminate, and enter the amount of time, which is 30 seconds, and press enter. Finally, press step and zero to return to the ready state. 
From the same drawer as where we found the bulb we used for toluene, grab a small bulb. Also, grab a small glass pipette without any graduation marks on it and fasten the small bulb onto it. Take the pipette, along with some paper towels and your filtered PMMA solution, right to the foot of the spin caster, so that they are ready when we need them. Pull the chuck off the spin caster so it can be wiped down with a wet paper towel. It takes a bit of force to pull up. To understand how to put the chuck back, examine the bottom of it. You'll notice there's a flat in the otherwise circular plastic piece. If you look at the spin caster, the metal piece left where the chuck once was is also mostly circular with one flat side. Line up the flats and push the chuck down onto the metal piece. Make sure it is secured by trying to pull it up a little. It shouldn't budge easily. Now we can finally start the HF step. Pour just a dribble of HF into the petri dish full of water and put away the HF bottle. Then with a plastic tweezer, remember HF dissolves glass, fish out a silicon wafer from your beaker, until now the wafers should have been sitting in water since your last rinse, and carefully place it in the petri dish. Submerge the wafer entirely first and then remove it from the bottom so that the wafer is floating on top of the solution with the shiny side in contact with the solution, that is, shiny side down. While having the wafers sit in a beaker covered with water makes them a little easier to fish out than if they were just partially dry after rinsing, both fishing wafers out of the beaker and getting them off the bottom of the petri dish is a little difficult, and particularly cumbersome with your extra and thick gloves. Be patient, but most of all, be careful. Once all of the wafers have gone through this process and are floating on top of the HF solution, you can start spin casting. Take a wafer floating in your HF solution and place it onto the chuck. When placing the wafer on the chuck, make sure it is centered on and entirely covers the small circle in the middle of the chuck. If it isn't totally covered, it may produce a bad vacuum seal and allow solution to get into the vacuum system. Open the yellow vacuum valve halfway with about three turns, the halfway point yields the best vacuum for this valve, and check the gauge next to the spin caster. It should read at least 22 inches of mercury. The yellow valve and gauge step might not be necessary. During the filming of this video, this is a temporary solution for a problem we were having with the spin caster. If, however, by the time you are using the spin caster, this problem has been fixed, then this step will be totally unnecessary and the spin casting system will have control over applying and releasing vacuum when appropriate. With the system in the ready state, we can press the green side of the foot pedal to run the set program. The first spin without applying solution is for spinning off any little droplets of water that might remain from the petri dish. Now use your glass pipette to take PMMA solution from its vial and dispel some solution onto the wafer, sitting shiny side up on the chuck. Cover the entire surface, but be careful not to let any solution overflow as it may get into the system through the vacuum. Press the green button and watch the wafer spin. Notice how the wafer changes colors as the PMMA thin film develops on its surface. Close the yellow valve unless the problem has been fixed and the spin caster is functioning normally, of course, and remove the wafer from the chuck. It may take a little effort since the wafer is the seal to the vacuum that had been applied until recently. Be gentle. Place your PMMA coated surface in a clean petri dish and repeat the process with the rest of your wafers. If for some reason you have to stop the spin casting short, you can press the red side of the foot pedal. An error message will appear when you do this, and to clear it, you press the green side. This will bring you to the ready state, and to run from there, you press the green side again. It should look like this. Label your petri dish full of PMMA coated surfaces with your name, the date, and PMMA surfaces. For the last step, get the HF and water waste bottle from the cabinet and a plastic funnel to help you neatly dispose of the HF solution from the petri dish, which isn't as simple to pour out of as a beaker is. Open up the bottle. Put the funnel in, and carefully pour the solution from the petri dish into the bottle. Since the funnel and petri dish are disposable, you can make sure they are dry, wrap them in some paper towels, and throw them away when you're done. Close up the waste bottle and put it back in the cabinet. Finally, the last part is annealing. From the sample magnet being all the way out, and briefly confirming the fact that all three valves are closed, we know that there are no samples currently in this sample line. Open valve C to bring the sample line to the same air pressure as the room, and then close valve C again. This is safe to do in this state, because the sample line is blocked from the main part of the oven by the closed gate valve A. It is important that the very low pressure in the main part of the oven be maintained. Then, open up the yellow flange clamp, and remove the sample holder from the sample line and place the sample holder on a clear table nearby. 
Carefully place your PMMA surfaces into the sample holder, making sure none of them is overlapping another one of them, and that each is flat on the wire mesh part of the holder, and not on top of the metal skirt surrounding it. Then, while holding the rubber o-ring in place, transfer the sample holder back from the table into the sample line, and fasten it closed with the yellow flange clamp. The sample holder is a bit heavy, so make sure to be careful and deliberate despite its weight. Being sure that both valves A and C are closed, isolating the sample line from both the main oven and the room, open up valve B. Open it up as far as it'll travel, and then turn it back one or two turns. Valve B communicates the sample line with the vacuum pump. Turn on the vacuum pump with the bottom rightmost button, and watch the pump's gauge sitting right on top of the pump. The needle must move beyond the mark at one tour before you can walk away from it. If it takes too long for this to happen, turn off the pump and ask for help. Before walking away for an hour, briefly check to make sure that the gauge for the main oven still reads in the 10 to the negative 7 or 8 tor range, and that the voltage reads around 6,000 volts. If either of these have moved far from where they should be, make sure valve A is closed and get help. After the pump has been running for one hour, you can open valve A. When opening valve A, turn it as far open as it'll go, this is about five full turns, and then give it a half turn back. You'll know that valve A is open because of the little red button that sticks out of the handle. It is crucial to check the ion gauge when opening valve A to make sure that the pressure does not increase higher than within the range of 10 to the negative 7 tor. If it does, close valve A and get help. Now you can close valve B, which communicates the pump and sample line, and turn off the pump. Finally, you can push the samples into the main oven by sliding the magnet from the right side of the bar to the left side. Make sure that the little white mark stays put. If you rotate the magnet, you might accidentally dump the PMMA surfaces out of the mesh holder. Let the samples anneal overnight. The next day, begin taking out the samples by sliding the magnet out to the right. Remember to keep the white mark steady. Close gate valve A entirely. This provides a good deal of resistance, so make sure that it is really closed. At the same time, you shouldn't force it beyond where it stops, so be careful. Then open valve C. You'll hear a little hissing when the sample line vacuum is released. When opening valve C, it is crucial to look at the ion gauge to make sure it doesn't jump past the 10 to the negative 7 tor range. Open up the yellow flange clamp and take the sample holder out of the line and onto the table. Now you can carefully take out your annealed samples and put them into their petri dish. Add annealed and the date taken out of the oven to the label so that you can keep track of your samples. Place the sample holder back into the line and fasten it closed with the yellow flange clamp. And before you go, just make sure that the valves are all closed and take a look at the gauge to make sure the main oven's pressure is appropriate. And there you have it. That is how you make PMMA thin films on silicon wafers for our group's experiments from start to finish. Good luck!